Good morning, everyone. How we doing? It's a nice snowy day in Northeast Ohio. Did anyone prepare for the snow? Like, did anyone expect there to be enough snow on the ground? No, I didn't either. We left our cars out last night. We're working on a house project, so our garage is full of wood and stuff, and so we left our, garage, our cars out. And everything's snowy, so it was miserable. Um, but hey, it's expected. It's November, so we, we were lucky for a while there. Uh, but thanks for being here. Uh, Larry is out this week and next week he's on vacation, which is well deserved. So we're glad you're here. We'll uh, we'll try to do it without him. He's probably not going to watch on YouTube anyway, so it'll be fine. Um, so let's do some announcements real quick. Um, next this week Wednesday, there's no Bible study because Larry's gone. I think everybody knows that already. That goes to Bible study. Um, but if you're planning on coming, don't come this week. Next week he'll be he'll be back. Um, then we decided we had a board meeting this past Monday. We're going to uh, not have services on Christmas Day or New Year's Day. They both fall on a Sunday this year, which is always horrible for pastors <laughs> and people who, like, you know, want to be with their families. So uh, we're just not going to have service that day. Larry will have some content he's going to put on Facebook and on YouTube that week. So if you want to keep up with, you know, church or whatever, uh, Larry will have some stuff online that we can, that you can pay attention to uh, to keep you in the Christmas spirit. And next week, uh, when he c or not next week, two weeks from now when he comes back, we'll start our Advent series because, believe it or not, that's Advent. We're starting that already. So... There goes 2022, right? So um, lots of exciting things. Did I miss anything? Is there anything else going on? Any prayer requests? Anything going on that we should talk about? We got It's a small group, so we can just talk. No? It's so, so, you know, I do youth group, and a youth group, everyone's talking all the time. It's like a back and forth. And then for church, it's just this, because... <laughs> We've been programmed to like not talk in church, right? Even as a kid, you're probably smacked in the back of the head if you if you talk at church. It's okay. Like we're a family, we're a community. We can talk and have conversation, and so it doesn't just have to be me up up here doing this. But for right now, I'll, I'll do this. All right. Um, let's start our worship service. Emma, if you'd like to join me, we'll stand and we'll sing our first song together. <laughs>
a quick video um, so we've been going through this series reframe for I think most of the summer and it's now November but we're this next week's gonna be the last week of reframe but uh, today we're gonna talk about um, reframing salvation a little bit which can be kind of tricky to navigate we're gonna take it real slow and be gentle with it um, but we're gonna watch a video to kind of introduce this topic um, based on a book that I use for the research today Several years ago we had an art show at our church and people brought in all kinds of sculptures and paintings and we put them on display and there was this one piece that had a quote from Gandhi in it. And lots of people found this piece compelling. They'd stop and sort of stare at it and take it in and reflect on it, but not everybody found it that compelling. Somewhere in the course of the art show, somebody attached a handwritten note to the piece and on the note they had written, reality check, he's in hell. Gandhi's in hell? He is? And someone knows this for sure and, and felt the need to let the rest of us know? Will only a few select people make it to heaven and will billions and billions of people burn forever in hell? And if that's the case, how do you become one of the few? Is it what you believe or what you say or what you do or who you know or something that happens in your heart? Or do you need to be initiated or baptized or take a class or converted or being born again? How does one become one of these few? And then there is the question behind the questions. The real question, what is God like? Because millions and millions of people were taught that the primary message, the center of the gospel of Jesus is that God is going to send you to hell unless you believe in Jesus. And so what gets subtly sort of caught and taught is that Jesus rescues you from God. But what kind of God is that, that we would need to be rescued from this God? How could that God ever be good? How could that God ever be trusted? And how could that ever be good news. This is why lots of people want nothing to do with the Christian faith. They see it as an endless list of absurdities and inconsistencies and they say, why would I ever want to be a part of that? See, what we believe about heaven and hell is incredibly important because it exposes what we believe about who God is and what God is like. What you discover in the Bible is so surprising, unexpected, and beautiful that whatever we've been told or taught the good news is actually better than that, better than we could ever imagine. The good news is that love wins. So that was a, a promo for a book that came out, I think, in 2010 or 11, uh, called Love Wins by Rob Bell, and that was the author, Rob Bell. Um, so he, talked, he had some interesting questions. And the book is also full of interesting questions and not a lot of answers, which is kind of his style. Um, if you've ever heard him preach, he used to be a pastor years ago, but uh, when he preaches, he just asks questions that maybe he doesn't answer during the sermon, which is kind of fun. It gets people thinking. Um, but people, other people didn't like that. <laughs> Some people just want to be told. But anyway, um, if you'd like to stand, we'll sing our next song together, which kind of leads into our, our sermon as well. Thy power throughout the universe. 
Hey everyone. So fun fact, the uh, we had some technical issues this morning and the sermon went well, but didn't get recorded. So I'm going to do it for you now. Um, during this reframe series that we've been doing, uh, we've been talking about ideas or views or traditions that we thought were true and casting them in a new light. Uh, today, I want to gently reframe the idea of salvation. And I say gently because for some, the act of knowing that if they're saved is the cornerstone of their faith, and I'm not trying to take that away from anyone. Uh, but maybe adding a new perspective to, sal to see how we see salvation in a new context, okay? So for those of you who grew up in a church, who, who of you prayed the prayer? And by the prayer, I mean maybe you're at a vacation Bible school or a youth group event or... Um, maybe an adult event where someone asks you to close your eyes and, and bow your head and then they, they prayed a prayer and you confessed and you decided to follow Jesus. Does anybody have that experience? Uh, I did. I had that experience in the summer of my, after my second grade year of school, there's a vacation Bible school near my house and I went for a couple of days and I brought a friend one day because it's not the church that I normally went to, but it was just nearby. So I wanted to bring a friend with me. And uh, this nice man in khaki pants came up to the the front of the class of second graders and asked if anybody wanted to to know more about Jesus. And for some reason, I thought he said, who knows about Jesus? And so I raised my hand. I was like, I know about Jesus. And uh, it turns out that he just wanted to do the prayer. So I, I did the prayer. I learned about Jesus that day. And uh, for me, it didn't change a whole lot day to day. I went back to no my normal life. I had one super... Christian friend growing up. Um, my family wasn't super, super religious, but I had one friend who was, and I told him that I prayed the prayer and I accepted Jesus, and he was very excited for me. I was kind of confused as why, because not much changed for me, um, but for him, it was a big deal, so that's good. Um, but even after that not you know, lackluster impact that it made on my life, I stuck with church for a long time. I was a youth group kid. I grew up uh, but even as I've been a youth pastor for the past 14 years, I have always felt uncomfortable to give a salvation message or to lead someone to Christ or to do the prayer with every eye closed and every head bowed kind of thing. Um, partly because I don't think that I ever felt like I had enough power to lead anybody anywhere. Uh, but also, I never fully knew why. Uh, I, I didn't like this until I started to dissect the idea of salvation and reframe it in a new way like we'll, we'll talk about today. So why why did I need to be saved? And saved from what? And is going to heaven, or, you know, in other words, um, avoiding hell, the only goal here? Because that just sounds like you say some magic words and you get a free ticket to heaven. And I don't think that's what Jesus meant when he said that. Uh, some pastors I've heard over the years say there's uh, nothing you can do to earn the free gift of salvation. It's just something that you receive from Jesus. But there always seems to be an asterisk. Um, you have to repent. You have to confess. You have to believe. And those are all action words. Those are things you have to do. And some pastors say you need a personal relationship with Jesus to get salvation. But those words aren't in the Bible at all. In fact, there are some words in the Bible about how you are saved. And here's some things according to the story of Jesus that, that say you get saved. So, Here's from Romans 10, verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So you have to declare and you have to believe. John 3, verse 3 says, Very truly, I tell you, no, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So you have to be born again somehow. Matthew 7, verse 21 says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So Matthew saying, or Jesus is saying in the book of Matthew that you have to do the will of God to be saved. Luke 18 says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. 
he would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So Jesus is saying in this verse in Luke 18 that we have to humble ourselves. The next chapter has a different example. So this, there's a story of Zacchaeus. He is a wee little man who climbed the tree and talked to Jesus. Uh, at the end of the story, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. So in Luke 19, verses 8 and 9, Jesus is saying you have to repay your debts, or at least promise to repay your debts, because Zacchaeus hadn't even done it yet. So promising to do something good gets you a seat in heaven, okay? Two more examples. Mark chapter 2. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing him to a paralyzed man, carried by the four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. So, if you have four friends that can carry you on a mat, you will be saved. But your friends, not so much. And here's the greatest example of all. In 1 Timothy verse, or chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says, but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So what is it? Is it something we do or is it something we say? Is it something we choose? Is it the actions of our friends? Or is it by having children that you are saved? It's kind of unclear. There's lots of examples. Or is it something like a free gift like Paul says in the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 23? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is the eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, what is it? And, if it's a gift, how do we receive this gift? Is the gift something like a picture frame that we stick on the wall and look at every once in a while? Or is it more like a house plant that we have to maintain and nurture? And, if we really don't have to do anything to get this free gift, there's no asterisk, then does that change the requirements of who can receive this gift? I've seen salvation used as a weapon against unbelievers. And even worse, I've seen it used against believers who believe differently. Salvation becomes a litmus test for certain strands of Christianity, like a bouncer at a club that decides if you get in or not. I've been and worked at some churches that weaponize salvation to exclude. And this is a real quote from someone I heard years ago at a different church. Um, one church member was speaking about another person and said, he's not even saved. But this unsaved person uh, was being more like Jesus because they gave their time to serve on the church worship team. And this other person was just gossiping. It seemed like the, the gossipy person didn't believe the unsaved person fit their criteria of what salvation is. And how did they know if they were saved or not? I don't think it's any, there's no way to know this for sure, unless they are giving, giving birth to children. Who knows? And yet you see language in the Bible that Jesus came to save all, that God so loved the world that he sent his son, that all nations will be blessed by God, that one righteous act resulted in the justification of all people. Now, what I think this happened, and I could be wrong, this is just my opinion, is that over time, there were some individuals who wanted to be the gatekeepers of God's power and freedom. And so they withheld salvation to only those who follow the rules, who fit in, who wanted to be in the club. Because if you join the club, you have to follow the rules of the club. But let me tell you something. I don't hold the keys to your salvation. And Larry doesn't either. No one does. It's not a secret that we need to stand up here or sit in our offices and tell you how to keep or maintain. Freedom is yours without any stipulations. And when I think, and I think that can be scary for people in power because it levels the playing field. Giving away the keys to deliverance creates an equality that is uncomfortable for those who want power. Looking at it another way, if you already have the cure, then you don't need to keep coming to people like me 
for the medicine. And the thing, the funny thing is, you were already born with the cure because the medicine was administered years ago. We were all inoculated generations ago, and the disease isn't even a problem anymore. So as we reconsider what salvation is, let's consider this free gift another way. Maybe it's not a personal invitation into a relationship with Jesus. Maybe it's not a ticket into the Afterlife Express. Maybe it's a realization or awareness that you were born free. And it can be a dangerous message for people who want to control others. Because this salvation is a freedom that can't be taken away. It's not a gift you can return. The gift is the change in perspective to a new life that you to a, that you can share. And not a share in a tell the world about Jesus kind of way, but like a sharing a meal with friends kind of way. It's like sharing a community garden that helps beautify the earth and creates a bond between people as the garden grows. Everyone works together with the same goal in mind. The gift of salvation is the gift of creating a better world for all and helping others to see they are welcome, they are invited, and they don't need to do anything or change anything to become anything or become anything to enjoy the garden we're all growing together. And this freedom we find in salvation removes the fear of hell and the promise of heaven because it gives us purpose now. It draws us back into this reality that makes great change happen now. It's less focused on then or up there or down there, but here in fighting for justice and freedom for all now. Instead of waiting for an afterlife, it creates a new life, or in other words, like we saw earlier, being born again today. It's a salvation from the sin of tomorrow or yesterday and gives us hope for today. As we close today, let's go forward knowing confidently we were saved before we walked in today. We were saved when we thought we were dead. We were saved before we were born because apparently our mothers were saved by childbirth. You are loved, you are accepted, and you are free. Let's join together to help others see their freedom that can't be taken away. And for our benediction today, I would like to read this prayer from Father Richard Rohr. Loving God, we love how you love us. We love how you free us. We love what you have given and created to surround us. Help us to recognize and to rejoice in what has been given, even in the midst of what is not given. Help us not to doubt all that you have given us, even when we feel our very real shortcomings. We thank you for the promise and sign of your love in the eternally risen Christ, pervading all things in the universe, unbound by any of our categories of logic or theology. We offer you ourselves back in return. We offer you our bodies, our little lives, our racing minds, and our restless hearts into this one wondrous circle of love that is you. My life is no longer just about me. It is all about you. Have a great week, everyone.